Page 94, the Private Eye podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of Page 94. My name is Andrew Hunter-Murray and this week we will be covering three separate things. We'll be talking about fires and fire brigades. We'll be talking about local television and local news across the country. And we will also be talking about Brexit, but only very briefly and at the end. And we do promise it is funny. But first, fire. Private Eye has been covering cuts to fire brigades across the country for many years now. They've been happening with increasing depth and severity, especially since 2010, shortly after all the money ran out. Jane McKenzie has been writing about a lot of fire-related issues for Private Eye for many years. Here she is with more details on exactly what is going on at the moment. This week, the Fire Service Inspectorate have come up with a report on 14 different fire brigades and their, their current state. And it's not very good news, really, for a lot of them, particularly Surrey, about whom the inspectors say they really aren't convinced that um, they're in a position to keep the public safe. Right. They've had very severe cuts over a lot of years now. The position for Surrey now is that they don't have enough firefighters to keep their fire engines on the road. What they're having to do is use a lot of people doing a lot of overtime and then call on neighbouring fire brigades when they need to. Right. The um, fire chief in Durham was saying this week that they, since 2012, have seen a 58% cut in the amount of funding that they get. That's extraordinary. Yeah, considerably more than half their funding is now gone. Who is it exactly who funds it? I mean, I presume that there's some kind of central government mandate to each county to say you have to provide a fire service and it has to be of sufficient quality. Yes. So the money is coming from council taxes. From local taxation. But obviously, one thing that we've been hearing a lot about and one thing that you've been speaking about on the podcast before is cuts to local government funding. Oh, yeah. For things like libraries or for parks or whatever it may be. So fire kind of fits into that pattern. Uh, yes, in terms of things being being locally funded and you can't ask the public for more money for it. Um, it's not something that, say, a local authority has the power to go over and above and say, actually, no, we're just going to raise council tax until we can pay for enough fire engines. I don't think people would think of a fire service as being in the same league as libraries or leisure facilities. It seems like more of an emergency and And essential Uh, it's the kind of thing i think you you would always expect a fire engine to turn up if you're on fire yes if you're a building um but yes it's not it's not an optional service at all um i mean not that libraries are but it's different in 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 so far as it's absolutely what we consider a sort of top level essential so i suppose one question to ask is how have departments managed to make these cuts for so long until now well, one of the ways sort of politicians have seen fire services as a soft target over the years is that for a good 20 years or so, the number of fire people being harmed by fires, which are actually different things. So you can have a lot of fairly harmless fires and a small number of really dangerous fires. Um, but both of these things were coming down. And this was due to things like smoking decreasing, people stopping having chip pans, improvements in home electrics, and also better fire prevention measures. So more buildings got sprinklers. And generally, there was a decrease in the amount of things going on fire. That's not the case anymore. Things started to sort of come back up again. Uh, And that's partly because with austerity... And, and all sorts of other things, there's not been the same money to spend on fire prevention measures. Right. And that's things like inspections or fire awareness or public awareness campaigns? This public sort awareness of stuff. campaigns, sprinklers, for instance. For a long while, it was part of the building code for schools that they had to have a sprinkler system. Right. As free schools and academies have come along, they don't actually have to. And a lot have chosen not to. Despite fire brigades saying, please do, they they are not doing. And schools are a very high target for arson. Something else that you mentioned was that arson has been rising as well. And arson has been going up too. And one thing I wanted to ask you about that is, obviously arson must be a feature in historical buildings that are going on fire. Obviously it's also to do with neglect in a lot of cases. Yeah. That they're just at fire risk and no one's making... No one's reducing the risk. Yes, exactly. I mean, there's there's the sort of occasionally with historical buildings, there's sort of 
suggestion that there's a sinister motive in getting rid of a building that's obstructing a development, that kind of thing. I think that's probably less common than the people just neglecting the building to the point where it is vulnerable to somebody else coming along and setting it on fire Right, is, is a more common thing that would happen. I mean, the other non-arson cause of, of fires, certainly past summer... With the drought, there was an awful lot of grassland fires, and that can just be caused by a piece of broken glass in a neglected building and very dried out grass. So it needn't be humans causing the fires, but if a building is neglected to the point where there's broken glass lying around, again, it's at more risk of catching fire. Yeah. So because of the number of fires decreasing for so many years, obviously fire services were then reduced in line with that. And now at the point that fires are rising again, obviously there will be much less capacity to deal with them. Yes. I'm not sure if there's so much that that was being brought down in line with the reducing amounts of fires so much as that it became very easy for a politician to say, oh, look at these firefighters sitting around in their fire stations eating pie. They're not doing anything. They're just having a wild old time. <laughs> well... <laughs> Actually, they're you know uh, they're waiting to save lives, but they you know while fires were decreasing, the, the they were being called on to do that less often. Has there been any other way that they've attempted to raise money? Because we cover PFI so much on this podcast. Ah, yes, indeed. Well, there are a number of fire services around the country still dealing with the legacy of having built new fire stations and a PFI. Okay. So that means they have that particular financial commitment before they can make financial decisions about anything else. So you can't say, well, we'll close that fire station and not this fire station because that fire station was built under PFI. So instead of making a logical choice, you're having to make a choice based on the fact that you've still got 30 years to pay on that building. Right. So there's an obvious incentive to keep that open because... Exactly. You're not ever going to be able to stop making those payments. Yeah. Even yeah. if, you know, it's the same as the PFI ghost schools where you end up with a sort of empty school, you can end up with an empty fire station. What there is empty is the fire control centres that were built. Yes. We've covered these a lot in the magazine. And they're, well, can you tell us a bit more about what the idea was behind these regional centres? The idea behind these regional centres was that technology will save us all and that having a small number of very big control centres where lots of people were sitting with headphones on taking 999 calls and then dispatching a fire engine to where it was needed rather than the more local fire control centres where you had people with local knowledge dealing with calls. Right. So um, there were 46 of these, I believe, in the old system. Yeah. And that would presumably be one for every brigade in the country so that's right you'd have the north yorkshire brigade or you'd have the, the london brigade or, yeah. or wherever it might be and when you called 999 you'd be speaking to somebody who would know the area for example in scotland where they have actually brought in one of these very big control centers there have been cases of people working at the call center trying to dispatch fire engines that would have needed to take two ferries to reach the fire in question right <laughs> so because the Lack of local knowledge, they didn't realise that that bit, you have to get a ferry. Oh, maybe we could send the fire engine that would go over a bridge instead. Right. Probably get there a bit quicker. And so the idea was to reduce it to to nine of these huge regional control centres for the whole country. That's right. But you say they're now standing empty, some of these. Absolutely. I think there's one in Taunton and there's one in Cambridgeshire that have been... They've never opened. They've, They've stood there full of shiny new carpets and computers and desks and everything and and never actually functioned. Why didn't they function? The fire brigades individually didn't buy into this plan. So these were built as a result of a a central government idea? Yes. But the local fire brigades were not keen on it? Absolutely. The fire brigades union strongly resisted it as well, but it really wasn't an idea that had been thought through before the money was spent on the buildings. Right. Right. What about fire vehicles themselves? So something we've been writing about recently is um, North Yorkshire's attempt to um, cut costs by introducing something called a TRV, a tactical response vehicle. So this is, instead of sending a proper fire engine, uh, these are sort of transit van-sized vehicles, which the idea is you only have a crew of two and 
they turn up to an incident. And you can imagine how you'd think, oh, well, there's, there are plenty of incidents where, honestly, you could probably deal with that. I mean, small, small fires, small I fires. suppose, yeah. The difficulty is that, to be honest, often a fire engine arriving at the scene doesn't know what it's arriving to until it gets there. So we have a report from a house fire where the TRV turned up and it was already too big a uh, fire for them to tackle. Now, they can't then start t- tackling a fire because they'd just be putting themselves in danger. So they have to stand there and wait for a rubber fire engine to turn up. And one of the stranger things that I, that you mentioned in this article was that they said, well, a lot of calls are hoaxes. Yes. So these smaller vehicles will well, cost be, less to deploy. They'll be deploy. perfect for dealing with a hoax. Perfect but for hoaxes, yeah. If you knew it was a hoax <laughs> when, you, when you dispatched the vehicle, that would be marvellous. But, but uh, unless we can introduce some kind of psychic control centre, <laughs> then I don't think that's going to help. So earlier when you mentioned the PFI funded, privately funded control rooms that were planned, um, that seems to have gone very badly. Has there been any attempt to privatise the vehicles themselves, perhaps? Yes, in London, there was a deal um, with a firm called Asset Co. They were going to own and maintain all the vehicles and then lease them to the fire brigade. Uh, this went badly, uh, as you might imagine. Uh, and Asset Co is now completely pulled out of the UK and, and is only providing fire engines in, in the Middle East these days. So they no longer work in London. Okay. So that attempt to privatise vehicles went very badly wrong. Have there been others? Well, one of the specialist firefighting services in the UK, the Defence Firefighters, um, have faced constant threats of just being wholly farmed out to the private sector. So what is is the Defence Firefighters? So on the various military bases um, around the, the country, there are, obviously there are, like anywhere else, things that go on fire, but they're, they're particularly hazardous things. So these are sort of munitions, the nuclear materials, there's all kinds of very specific fire risks. So there is a specialist firefighting uh, organisation sort of based within the military. So they are not part of the local fire service they're specialists who work uh, for the MOD there's long been a sort of a notion in the MOD that this this could be something that they sort of shunt off into the private sector to save money on yeah oh and of course there's um, bases abroad as well this sounds like a complicated thing to privatize Uh, as in you'd really have to privatize to someone you could trust yes absolutely so Obviously, the the two marvellously trusted outsourcing firms that, that were on the cards for this job were the ISOL pals Capita and Serco. Uh, as you can probably imagine, the uh, defence firefighters were not hugely keen on being passed over to these organisations. Yes, and I think you've written that that bid has currently been scotched for the moment. MPs have paused, written to... Paused, I believe, is the, the term used. Ah, OK, um, paused. Yeah, All right. Paused. So... Given that fires are rising, and as you said, that arson is rising, and you know prevention has suffered so much in the last 10 or 20 years, is there any sign of pressure on the government to start increasing the spending again? Well, certainly these reports from the inspectorate could, could put some pressure because they've just completed the first third of doing a complete review of all the brigades. Uh, and... With the first third, there's already sort of strong evidence of the problems being caused by the reduction in prevention and um, the cutbacks. Uh, So I think if that picture continues from the the other two thirds, it's going to be very hard for the government to ignore their own inspectorate on on the need to properly fund a fire service. And the first third is places like Surrey, as you were saying, which just can't provide the service properly yeah. anymore simply due to the, a lack of funding. Yeah. Okay, so I suppose we'll be looking out for the next two-thirds of those reports on the state of the nation's fire services. Yes. Yeah, we'll keep an eye out and see how they go. Jane McKenzie there. Now, 
local television. This is another story which applies across the entire UK and, of course, concerns funding and funding cuts and where money gets to be spent. A few days before Christmas, Ofcom launched a review of regional TV production guidance trying to ensure that programmes which claim to be made outside London really are and pointing out there may have been some sharp practice going on. Adam McQueen writes a great deal for privatised media news pages, so I started off by asking him about this skullduggery. Alleged skullduggery. Should we go as far as alleged skullduggery? <laughs> Ofcom, the uh, the broadcasting watchdog, were very careful to say that all of this stuff that they've set out in their latest consultation uh, document is only anecdotal uh, evidence. They, they they haven't actually verified all of it. But this is stuff that came in from they did a consultation uh, earlier in the year uh, asking for um, people's thoughts on how the quotas for regional uh, production and regional programming were being handled by the uh, public service broadcasters. So this is the uh, the four main broadcasters. So you've got uh, the BBC, the third channel operators who are uh, ICV and um, STV up in Scotland, uh, Channel 4 and Channel 5, all of whom are obliged to produce a certain amount of their uh, programming every year from the nations and regions. So some of it in Scotland, some of it in Wales, some of it in various places uh, outside London. And uh, yeah, no, there are suspicions uh, that these um, guidelines aren't always being applied in quite the uh, spirit in which they are intended. And it's quite a large amount. So the BBC has to produce 50%. Yeah, this is what all of that. There's been a big move in the broadcasting industry over the last few years to uh, to do this outside London stuff. You remember the big, big fuss uh, a few years back when the BBC moved a large chunk of their operations up, up, up to Salford. And then, of course, last year we had the news that Channel 4 would be moving its headquarters, no less, to Leeds and setting up there. And I, actually, it was one of those odd things where if you read the small print of the announcement uh, about this new new HQ in Leeds, uh, it was going to be 200 staff up in Leeds. And um, this, this tiny little peripheral office that was going to be left behind in London was going to have a mere 500 staff left in it, which, you know, <laughs> from, from anyone else's perspective, looks kind of like a national HQ. But um, no, apparently not. No, no, it's Leeds all the way. So as you say this this shift is is happening you know these targets are a part of that shift or they're, they're related to it but the uh, the report from ofcom has said that there are these things called pop-up and temporary offices yeah essentially a lot of this is uh programs being farmed out to supposedly regional producers who actually turn out to have an office somewhere out in the regions uh up in yorkshire or scotland or wherever uh, which is basically just sort of two men and a dog who are only there for the duration of the time that program is being made and are then, then going to pack up and uh, head straight back to London. Um, the dog may even not hang around for that long. And in some cases, you don't even have the two men and a dog up there, according to Ofcom. There's just the, what they call brass plate offices, which really are just essentially a mailbox, which is redirecting the post down to London. Uh, and these people who are supposedly making uh, programs embedded in communities throughout the British Isles and employing local people are all based in an office in some Soho, like so many other uh, TV companies. That seems not to be really within the spirit of the rules. Are there other examples of how this sort of alleged uh, chicanery is going on? Yeah, Ofcom talked about um, anecdotal evidence of uh, uh, companies or individuals based in the nations and regions. They said, e.g. post-production houses and executive producers who were just offered payment to be credited on production, I.e. just to have their names in the titles at the end, when they haven't actually had anything to do with the production at all, which is fantastic work if you can get it. If you can wow. sit in, in, in York or something and get credited as an executive producer without having to do anything whatsoever actually i'm saying that anyone in the tv industry now will be laughing hollowly and saying there's quite a lot of executive producers who do nothing whatsoever <laughs> but even as an editor or one of those people who do enormous amounts of work on programs uh, just be, if you can just be there to make up the numbers and take a pay packet for that then that also might have been in the past enough to qualify you uh, as a regional production under the uh, ofcom guidelines that's extraordinary it is pretty pretty scammy isn't it it's um it, it's fairly outrageous yeah and and you, you the, one of the other things you mentioned in the article is that it's an incredibly confusing system so you use the example of channel 5's program yorkshire a year in the wild it is extraordinary so off, off ofcom have said uh, as well as tightening up their rules and the way that they're applied they're, they're also going to uh tighten up the way that they keep records of these things and they are incredibly confusing so there's this thing called the made outside london london titles register which is enormous 
document that Ofcom put out every year, which is as fascinating as, as the title makes it sound. But one of the things I found in there, and there's absolutely no suggestion that any, this is in, in any way wrong or that, that anyone's doing anything wrong here, but counted as a programme which met all the criteria to qualify as a Northern England programme coming from, from the Northern, Northern England region is Channel 5's Yorkshire A Year in the Wild. Sounds like an old thing production, doesn't it? Absolutely. Until you look across the, uh, the, the, the table in this document and you see that it's made by Tigris Productions London. And then when you actually look at the Tigris Productions London website, they describe themselves as a Bristol production company. <laughs> At which point, you know, I, I, I didn't do very well in geography, but I'm completely lost in this. So, but but this, 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 this is something that absolutely meets the guidelines, even as they stand. There was also one other wonderful story, which I remember from a few years back, uh, which is when Question Time, which had been made for years by uh, Mentor Media, which is a big London-based production company, was uh, farmed out to the nations and regions. It was a BBC commission, and, and they said, you know, we want this to be made from, from the nations as it comes up for the new contract. And lo and behold, uh, it turned out to go to uh, Mentor Productions Scotland and is now produced from Glasgow, uh, which is quite weird on several levels because, I mean, the one thing everyone knows about Question Time is it's produced from a different part of Britain every single week. So it kind of seems to be quite a sort of regional uh, production in that, in that sense anyway. But the way that that was actually done was apparently that um, a group of staff from the London office of Mentorn headed up to Glasgow on the train, sat there, had a Skype call, dialed in to have a chat to Danny Cohen, who was the then BBC controller, who was sitting in his office at Broadcasting House, which was a few hundred yards from uh, from the uh, Mentor London office where they would normally be found. The last one I really want to talk about is Night Screen. Yeah. So the most extraordinary thing in this entire uh, Ofcom document, this, this, this great long screen of stuff, which I've read so you don't have to, uh, concerns a programme or, in fact, not something you could really count as a programme. And actually, the uh, Ofcom, in what is a very, very dry document, do manage to sound a very sceptical note when they say that um, this is something that just about manages to meet the broad definition of a programme as set out in the Communications <laughs> Act. So not only are they saying that they don't really count it as a regional thing, they don't even really think it's a TV programme. Uh, and this is something called ITV Night Screen. Now, you may not have come across ITV Night Screen. It's something that's broadcast between about three o'clock in the morning when uh, programmes end on ITV and five past five in the morning when, as all early rising couch potatoes know, there is a repeat of the Jeremy Kyle show. I'm sure you're up for that every morning, Andy. Um, and this is literally just a series of screens showing uh, stills from, uh, from the ITV programmes that are going to be on the next day and a description, pretty much the text that would be in the Radio Times. This is essentially nothing more than a very slightly more high tech version of pages from CFAX. There's a reference there for the, uh, for the younger <laughs> listeners. Uh, a sequence of animated pages which promote ITV's upcoming programs, Ofcom said. Okay. Uh, which they, they thought was unlikely to create many jobs or development opportunities for production talent. And as you mentioned in the piece, Night Screen on ITV was 85% of the total public service television produced in the Midlands and East region of the UK. So yeah. they're going to have to yeah, scramble. Yeah, which is an to... enormous region. Yeah. This is this is not just kind of North Norfolk Digital. This stretches right over from the East Coast all the way over to the Welsh border. Um, an enormous amount of it. Uh, yeah, 85, 85% of it was just this this kind of um, pages from CFAX thing. And this kind of ties into something else that you've been covering recently, which is local TV stations. Because this was a huge brainchild of Jeremy Hunt's, and he set it up in 2000. It's not just recently, Andy. I, I, I have been banging on about these local <laughs> TV stations for years and years is in the pages of the eye and probably no one else cares but i cannot see why this is not more of a scandal so this was the top wheeze of jeremy hunt when uh, as few people remember now he was culture secretary before uh, before he took over as health secretary and his big thing was that he wanted local tv stations not just kind of your local news that, that appears after the news at 10 but actually sort of ultra local things for cities and even every city and even every town in britain was going to have its own tv station and um, it was going to revitalize that that, that market and get lots and lots of local people involved in making fa- fascinating TV programs. And £25 million was hived off the BBC licence fee in order to pay for this uh, pet project of Jeremy Hunt. £25 million. I mean, that's, that's almost a third of the new EastEnders set. That is a large <laughs> amount of money we're talking about here. This is money that, you know, could have been used for uh, probably funding Radio 4 for an awfully long time. A hell of a lot more episodes of Doctor Who than we're currently getting <laughs> per year. 
I don't know. I mean, even something really, really kind of Reithian, like a, um, a, a, another series of Hotter Than My Daughter or, or Snog Marry a Void. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> Could have been. Instead, it, lots of moolah. Yeah. <laughs> instead, it was spent on, on, on this idea that everyone in the broadcasting industry told Jeremy Hunt at the time was very, very unlikely to work. And one that actually had the effect not only of not doing what it was intended to do, but of killing off one genuinely local station that had been operating for years up in Manchester, uh, Channel M, which was run by uh, the publishers of the Manchester Evening News, very successful, uh, very good local paper up there. And they closed down in 2012 because they felt that they wouldn't be able to compete with the new uh, Jeremy Hunt-backed local TV station for the very limited amount of advertising there was up there. So that went. And instead, Manchester is one of the many places which got this local TV station, which is churning out content, which is in no sense of the word local at all, because it's owned by this enormous conglomerate, which has ended up hoovering up nearly all of these... uh, these local TV contacts, which is called That's TV. And if you have a look at the That's TV website, you can see that their local stations range from as far as uh, That's North Scotland, uh, right down to um, That's South Wales down in Cardiff. It, you, you know, they, 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 they're, they are not local by, in, in any sense of the word. And in fact, an awful lot of their programmes are effectively networked from uh, That's TV's main production hub, which is up in Leeds. So it's, it's not doing what it was set up to do in any way whatsoever. But as I say, they've got the Scottish ones now as well, because even STV, it ran these several local stations. Uh, as of last year, they found there was no way to financially make them work. They were closed down and also sold to That's TV, this, this big company down in Leeds. I had a quick look, just even as we speak, uh, uh, what's being broadcast on various uh, various ones of these local local TV stations. So this is a uh, that's Cambridge. Just looking at this, their local programming this afternoon includes Cary Grant in Penny Serenade, a very nice old film from um, from 1941. Not not enormously connected to Cambridge, I think. Mohawk after that, a western. Um, the western reaches of Cambridge, out in the Mises and Buttes and Dead Country, somewhere beyond Cherry Hinton, and Wacky Taxi, the 1972 film. Uh, okay, so fair enough. Let's have a look at, uh, well, That's West Scotland. What have they got on this afternoon that's not relevant to Ayrshire? Uh, we've got, oh, Harry Grant in Perry, Penny Serenade, 1941. Mohawk, a western, and Wacky Taxi, the 1972 film. This is not... I don't think what what Jeremy Hunt had in mind at the outset. And indeed, Ofcom uh, ruled uh, in July that the experiment had effectively failed and that the various other towns and cities that they were going to roll out or try and roll out these local stations to offer commissions to to companies to run these things, they just weren't going to bother anymore. 13 specific areas will never now get their own local TV station. The rest of them, meanwhile, withering on the vine, unloved, unwatched, largely... There may be people out there who are, who are tuning into That's Norwich every day and desperate to see those uh, whatever they're broadcasting. Uh, but as far as I can see, the one real contribution of these local TV stations has been to provide a training on London Live, the, the London version, for Amol Rajan, uh, who then went on to a job in proper telly and is never off our screens or off our radios these days. Well, it feels like it's all been worth it just for that, I'd say. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Adam McQueen there. Now, for the final item in today's programme, we turn to Brexit. Private Eye runs an occasional feature called The History Boys, which deals with historical comparisons, some apt, some less so. One thing that people love to do with Brexit is to compare it to various different historical events, but there has been an enormous tussle over exactly which one it is most like. Here it is Private Eye's Francis Ween clarifying in extremely simple terms and once and for all exactly which historical event it is most like. It just struck me uh, over the last year how much of this debate is conducted in 1066 and all that terms. I mean, remember 1066 and all that, things like uh, yeah. Waterloo uh, meant that Britain was now top nation and this was therefore a good thing. It's all that sort of stuff. It's uh, Charge of the Light Brigade. They didn't quite agree on what the Charge of the Light Brigade was. There were several people, I think Andrew Mitchell, the Tory MP, said that it was Theresa May's vote that she was going to present but then cancelled before Christmas. But uh, another Tory MP said that actually it was the 2017 general election that was the valley of death. And Jacob Rees-Mogg said, no, actually it was the Chequers plan that was the, uh, the charge of the light brigade. And Rees-Mogg is terrific at this because he's, uh, his, his very first speech when he was elected in 2010, his maiden speech, he paid a special tribute to Alfred the Great. 
and of course in 1066 <laughs> and all that, they say it's very important not to confuse Alf- King Alfred with King Arthur, and they then proceed to spend about the next five pages doing exactly that. <laughs> saying, now, one of them was something to do with cakes, and one of them was something to do with the round table on which he ate the cakes and the burnt cakes. And, uh, and Rhys Mogg said, Alfred the Great, the first Eurosceptic who got rid of the Danes and made England independent until Ethelred the Unready, um, rather unreadily, let them all back in again. Waterloo, the Glorious Revolution, it's also Magna Carta, it's the Burgesses coming at Parliament, it's the Great Reform Bill, it's the Bill of Rights, it's Waterloo, it's Agincourt, it's Cressy. We win all of these things. Or <laughs> we win all of these things. Um, and there, that was at the Tory fringe meeting, uh, the conference in 2017, and an audience member said, Trafalgar? And Rhys Boggs said, and Trafalgar, absolutely. Um, and so it goes on. And then he had a wonderful thing where he, so the Suez crisis crops up quite a lot. You remember when Boris Johnson's brother, um, the other Johnson, Joe, uh, resigned last year? He said it was uh, yes. shaping up to be the um, greatest failure of British statecraft since the Suez crisis. And actually, Boris, his brother, his Brexiting brother, agreed with him for once and said, yes, it is, bad as Suez. Um, <laughs> Dominic Raab, the former Brexit secretary, chips and says, yes, but it's not Dunkirk, just to clarify matters. Um, and Rhys Mogg inevitably has brought out the Suez crisis during one of his speeches, and he said it will be a worse national humiliation than the Suez crisis because the Remainers now model themselves on Mr. Hiru Onoda, that's the Japanese soldier who stayed in the jungle for 29 years because he didn't believe the war was over. <laughs> had very little to do with the Suez crisis. Um, it was like the Sun last year had um, 1066. I mean, obviously, the Battle of Hastings crops up a lot. One day, they accused Theresa May of leading us to the greatest defeat since the Norman Conquest in 1066, the last time we capitulated to a foreign power. And then the very next day, they said how she can avert this catastrophe and save us from the Battle of Hastings is discover her inner Boudicca. Boudicca is odd. She's not on the um, by a tapestry Boudicca, but apparently she was there. Um, oh, she was about 600 years before that, wasn't she? Uh, well, it was a little a while or two before that. Uh, yeah. But still, that... <laughs> But the, uh, actually, that was a piece in The Sun written by Nick Timothy, Theresa May's former head of staff. And he said, oh, of course, right. some, pen, some pedants may point out that Boudicca was, in fact, bloody defeated by the Romans. Uh, but nevertheless, Boudicca is the right president for Theresa May, whatever the details, he said, which is wonderful, 1066 <laughs> and all that. And he said, Boris Johnson, here we are, uh, talking 1066. He said, if the Chequers plan was adopted, it would mean for the first time since 1066, our leaders were deliberately acquiescing in foreign rule. And actually, in this week's Private Eye, we've got a little detail from the Bayard Tapestry, that famous bit that shows King Harold deliberately acquiescing in foreign rule with an <laughs> arrow sticking out of his forehead. And it's odd, actually, because when they talk about deliberately acquiescing in foreign rule, um, he might have also have mentioned um, William of Orange in 1688. But, as it also says in 1066 and all that, 1688 isn't one of the memorable dates in English history. There are only two. There's 55 BC and 1066, and so they're the only ones that really count. <laughs> the, it's all that most of their analogies are to do with foreign invasion. I mean, the ones they celebrate. So they celebrate 1688, the Glorious Revolution, which was, okay. of course, you know, a foreign power coming in. But apparently that, that's marvellous and deserves to be celebrated, according to Rhys Mogg. You know, the Wars of the Roses... Uh, this is Dominic Sandbrook, the Daily Mail's pet historian, who was saying it's a good thing that we're now terribly divided. Remainers say this terrible Brexit has divided the country, but this is a marvellous thing, a divided country, because like all families, we've always loved the quarrel. I mean, this absolute chutzpah saying they <laughs> torn the country in half, and that's how we <laughs> like it. From the Wars of the Roses and the Reformation to the English Civil War, we've always loved a quarrel. They were a bit more than quarrels, I think you'll find most of the things. But also, the Wars of the Roses uh, also <laughs> ended with an invasion from abroad from France when Henry Tudor came back out of exile with some French mercenaries and um, uh, bumped off Richard III at Bosworth Field, or Boswell Field, as they called it in 1066 and all that, named after Dr Johnson's biographer. <laughs> so it's all a bit of a muddle, I'm afraid. Um, thank God the teaching of history in schools is as rotten as Michael Gove used to say it was. Francis Ween there. That's it for this week's episode of Page 94. We hope you've enjoyed this one and we will be back again in a fortnight with another. Goodbye.